Um, first of all, uh, thanks for coming and attending presentation, this presentation. Sorry. Imagine in the coming days, you come across your manager and he, she asks you, designing a new e-commerce platform. How would you do? What would be your approach? Today, we will take you in such a journey, explaining how we will do, giving you some tips, clues, and tricks. Before going further, let us introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Alexandre Touré, I'm a software architect. You probably recognize my accent, I'm French. And also a senior developer, Swiss Marine Knife at Worldline. You can reach me using these pointers, please. Yes, and hello everybody. I'm Raphael, I'm also French. I'm also a software architect. I design a large and complex system. Uh, and I also work at Worldline. And I tried something uh, that Sander did. Uh, I tried to find in my name what I was predestined to, to do in IT. The only thing I could find was YAML. So it's not object-oriented. I don't know if it's uh, a sign or something. Anyway. OK, uh, who doesn't know Worldline? Where's Yann? OK, just to cut the story short, uh, we are the leaders in the payment industry in Europe. And most of the time, when you pay online, when you pay uh, in stores, uh, you use our applications. So, and no, so now something completely different. We are here today to design the new Donuts at Home platform. Donut at home. Donut at home. Really? Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. yeah, seriously. All right. Yeah. A customer yeah. asked us designing the new Amazon website for Donuts delivery. Okay, yes. Uh, you heard about the Omega project? I just finished this one. I think it's quite similar to the Donut at Home uh, project. We should maybe change the front end uh, stack and uh, up we go, huh? I guess. Yeah. That will be easy. Yeah, it could be nice to start focusing on the customer needs first, if you're okay. Okay. <laughs> right, maybe I'm. And uh, we can talk a little bit about the approach to do. The approach? Uh, regarding architecture? Yeah. Yeah, Togaf. No way. No. <laughs> no way. <laughs> oh, right. No way. Uh, you don't like Togaf? No, I don't like it. Okay. Um, well, what I suggest we go, we dive into the requirement and stuff, and then we'll, we'll discuss again. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, okay. That's going to be a long one. Yeah. So uh, we had the first meeting with the customer, so we start focusing on the, the customer's needs, first on the functional requirements. Uh, the first, the customer wants to create a um, new website which can enable the creation of donuts, customizing them using predefined topics. Topics, sorry. Obviously, you can buy them online and you can deliver them at home. Yeah, okay, now I understand. Well, I have to admit, it's a little bit different from the Omega project. Yeah, I was... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> a little bit too uh, in a hurry. Uh, but then it raises a lot of questions about, like, I don't know what is the data loss that is accepted, what is the availability expected, or what is the maximum response times. You see that kind of stuff. Yeah, hold on. We, we could do that step by step. You okay? All right, all right. Okay. Um, during the first meeting, we also yeah. deep dived into the non functional requirements, technical requirements, to define the SLOs service level objectives. First, we discussed about the availability. D during the first discussions, uh, the customer asked to design a 100 availability platform. Ah, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, it doesn't make sense. We know that it doesn't make sense, but we had to explain why it didn't. First of all, we said that beyond, for instance, beyond 90% availability, both the cost and the complexity go, uh, go exponential. Then we discussed about Time to respond. He said, OK, I would like to have all my web pages rendered up to two seconds. What about uh, mobile applications? We don't know yet. And we don't have any information yet also about uh, data losses. OK. Well, I think even if we are at the requirement phase and uh, we're speaking about business needs, we have to integrate some kind of compliance because it's something that we have to, to integrate it to our design on the early stages. and. Because it's an e-commerce platform, I think we have to deal with uh, GDPR and uh, private uh, data. Yeah. So just keep that in mind, and maybe some payment or banking regulation that we have to comply with or stuff like that. Yeah. 
So, yeah. And one other topic to address is about the hosting, because we don't have any information yet about uh, which strategy to adopt. Should we deploy on the top of a public cloud provider? Should we deploy on premise? I don't have information yet. I don't know if I have to propose this feature to the customer or should it be a requirement. But they didn't say anything about something they do already? Or? No, not yet. No. All right. Well, I, sh I suggest that we, we go straight to the cloud right now. Uh, and uh, even if at the end of the day we don't deploy on the cloud, it's a good way to structure our application. Well, it's an hypothesis that I'm making here. We should trace it in uh, ADR, by the way. ADR? What does it stand for? ADR? Oh, you don't know ADR? No. Oh, no, ADR, it's, uh, it's very easy. It uh, stands for uh, Architecture Decision Record. It's a very simple and easy way to trace, uh, share, and review your decision regarding architecture. You see, it's based on a markdown format. And uh, what is important here is to trace what is the status, what is the context of the decision, but also uh, what are the consequences at the time of uh, the decision. And then, by doing that, you keep track and you keep trace of the history of, uh, of the architecture and the modification on our architecture. So let's trace it here and say we go, um, that's the hypothesis we are making now, we go for the cloud because we want uh, to optimize the per-per-use uh, scalability. Okay. Uh, now we define the hosting strategy. Could be nice to do a first iteration of the risk analysis, if you're okay. Oh, yes. Regarding the risk, I also recommend to formalize a little bit. Just simple stuff like that kind of matrix, you know, where uh, you prioritize and uh, analyze the, the risk regarding the probability of occurrence and uh, the impact when it, it occurs. The idea is to uh, mitigate the risk and move them, most, almost most of them, in the green zone. You agree with that? Yeah. Okay, no, based on former project, could be nice. No, we can start uh, filling this matrix with yeah. some uh, well-known uh, risk we can deal with, uh, such as the unavailability of middlewares. Either should the application should be deployed on top of public cloud provider or on-premise, it could be the same. Database access errors and network errors too. We can mitigate the risk and put uh, them in this matrix, in this box, if you're okay. Yeah, I think it's a good start, and uh, well, well, we'll go through and review and refine this matrix all along the way of the uh, design, and uh, it's a good way okay. to start, yeah. So what did we do during this first step? First, we focused on the user needs. Why creating a new application? You have to understand that. Then we deep dive into the requirements. Unfortunately, we don't have information yet about the retry time objective, the query point objective. The first one is one is the, the time you can have the application offline, such as uh, doing a crash. And the, the second one is the um, data loss, which is possible, for instance, during a crash. Hopefully, we have our first SLO, service level objective. We know that 90% of the transaction should be rendered into up to two seconds. And the availability should be at least 95%. Unfortunately, the number of users is really be foggy because uh, we have uh, 500,000 500, users a day, but it doesn't make sense because we don't have any information about the throughputs, about the peaks. And last, uh, last uh, your requirements of the customer is we need to integrate the ability to easily integrate new features. When the customers say easily, it means fast and cheap. <laughs> Yes, obviously, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, and something we saw uh, is compliance is also important to take into account. So we spoke about uh, bank and payment standards and regulation and also GDPR. And uh, last but not least, uh, formalism and uh, start uh, from the early stage to trace and track uh, things. So track uh, architecture uh, related to, uh, I mean, decision related to architecture in ADR and uh, start a, a matrix to uh, analyze and uh, mitigate the risks or not. Okay. Ah, all right. Let's go back into the architecture approach. So, okay, I understood. Not a gaffe. Um, 
how should we? Oh yes, uh, when you have to, <laughs> when you have to, to discuss, to exchange with uh, customers of your colleagues about uh, design, architecture, or schemas. What, what, what formalism do you use uh, usually? Yeah, for four years now, I've been using a C4 model. A C4. Pretty straightforward, I guess. Oh yes. Yes, I'm more of uh, Archimate, but uh, I won't go into no, the same thing. <laughs> uh, I, I heard about C4, but I don't know it. C can you present it quickly? Yeah. yeah. Um, C4 was created by Simon Bond. Uh, strongly recommend this book, Software Architecture for Developer. It's worth it. And you can get all the relevant information on the c4model.com website. C4 model helps you designing and presenting your vision using four models. And uh, in the same way that um, Google Earth, when you start from the planet, then the country, city, and so on, you will present your architecture in the same way. For instance, here is the system context view, when you present your functional view of your application. What is the service? What are the functionality rendered and uh, provided by your application? And when you deep dive, you see that's under the hood. I won't describe the whole diagram. It, it could be really uh, complicated, but you can see that I did, uh, I'm stressed out uh, the topics, the middleware, the relevant technologies such as Angular, Spring Boot, so on, and the corresponding transactions. OK. All right, thanks. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a kind of formalism where you have different views depending on the stakeholders yeah. and you want to like them. Yeah, it reminds me of something. All right, All right. okay, let's go. Uh, let's use that then. So uh, regarding donut at home, maybe what, so it's system context? Yeah, system yes. yes um, let's start with this one. Uh, what I propose is uh, we design our own view on each uh, on, on our side, and then we, we 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 mix and we discuss and we see how we do, how to okay. go from there. So yeah? a few days later, okay. Um, right. <laughs> here is my uh, the functional view I designed. So I identified two kind of customers, the administrators and customers, and I split the Donuts at Home platform into two subsystems: the core system, the Donuts at Home system, and the delivery information system, in order to reuse it uh, later on. And then I strictly externalized the payment subsystem. Why? Because uh, it could be tricky to handle it uh, due to the, all the compliance to strive with, such as uh, PCI DSS. And for the bank transfer, I propose to use the good old uh, file batches. All right. OK. Yes, well, let me share my, my own design then. Uh, basically, uh, well, so we're okay with the, who are the, the users and the stakeholders. Uh, what I did, uh, because I know this customer, so the, it's their first e-commerce project, but uh, they already do some delivery yeah. stuff. So they have a mutualized delivery platform already. Okay. So the idea is no. to reuse that. Uh, so I didn't put it in the, in the core of the system that we have to design. I, I put it outside. But regarding payment, uh, because it's uh, their first e-commerce uh, project, uh, I thought it was the good opportunity to start to build something that uh, they might mutualize later, just like they did with the delivery platform. That's why I put it in the core. Regarding the bank and the stuff, yes, I think we agree on that. OK, it, so. it makes sense for the delivery. Mm. I didn't know. So, so how we should uh, go further now? Because I don't uh, know. Ah. But let's use the public. You're the third architect. Uh, maybe you could vote on the two different options that uh, we propose. Uh, so there is uh, Alexandre's view and then uh, mine. So you, you see the difference? Basically, we just uh, interverted the, the delivery uh, service or platform and the payment system. So in Alexandre's view, it's, uh, the delivery is inside the, the core system. And in my view, it's the reverse. So maybe we can vote and by raising your hand. Uh, who is voting for, for this, uh, this view, the first one? Don't be shy. OK. All right. And who is voting for me? I mean, no, not for me, for my, uh, my design. <laughs> All okay. right. Oh, that's going to be tough. Could be 50, what should 50. we do? Maybe we should vote also, no? Yeah. What do you think? I think we can make a mix of both. 
A mix. Oh, yeah. A mix of both, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a good idea. Well, thank you for your help. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> the third scenario, yes. So, we choose to keep only the core system to develop and to produce. We externalize when, when we use existing subsystems, such as the delivery information systems, such as the payment and the bank, uh, the bank transfer. And we, uh, we choose to focus only on the core system and what the, uh, exactly what the user needs. Okay. Um, to sum up this part, uh, first think about designing your architecture through several views, from the functional view uh, to the application, to uh, the um, functional uh, business view, application view, and so on. It will help you presenting your architecture to different stakeholders, managers, compliance, security officers, production engineers, and so on. Then don't hesitate to confront your different point of views. It's really important. It will help you get your architecture better. Yes, and also avoid the not invented here uh, syndrome, you know. Sometimes, uh, well, we do that all, all the time, <laughs> but uh, you might reinvent uh, the wheel, but this wheel will be squared because <laughs> many people take many, many years to make some round wheels that are working very well. So that's the idea with the delivery platform. And uh, sometimes also uh, the make or buy. Should we make it or buy it outside? If it's uh, outside our core uh, scope, uh, business scope, maybe it's not uh, our main concern, so we should uh, source the component outside, like we did with the payment. And basically, some, some companies are doing quite yeah. a lot of payment. Right? <laughs> you heard about that? Okay. okay, I don't know what you mean. Um, so now, we identify the main functionalities to create. It's time to see what will, what will we do and what will be under the hood. Usually, when you design an application, you design against several characteristics. Well, here are the main characteristics of what an architecture should be. Maybe regard, regarding your industry, your concept, your project, you will have different characteristics. But these characteristics are based on your experience from um, Raphael and myself. First, think about simplicity. If you, if you attended uh, the first keynote, it will remind you uh, some topics. Start as easy as possible, but think about your, your architecture must evolve along the years. And think about the modularity. It will help you, for instance, moving from one database to one another without breaking the whole platform. Then think about cost and performance and try to find a good balance with them. Because you can design the most performant application, the most performant platform, if it costs twice the price, it won't be accepted. Yeah. If you want to deploy your application, it's even more, more important now, if you want to deploy on top of a public cloud provider, think about the fault tolerance. It's a mandatory feature now. And last but not least, think about testability. In my opinion, testability is a good smell, because if you can test easily your application, maybe you fade in the simplicity, the modularity, or the evolutivity. It's very important. Yeah, and I was just in a conference. Maybe now you should add now uh, green, the green aspect. You know how uh, is the impact on the ecology. But what is important now is to have a, a frame to to make decision. What I propose, based on that, we should review the kind of architecture that uh, that we see today. Let's say or we saw in the past also. Uh, review them very quickly, and then what I propose to you then is to compare them regarding the criteria. And then going back in the donut, yes, donut at home uh, project, uh, we'll see wha what fits best uh, our need. So let's go, if you agree with that, yes, with the monolith. Uh, so very, very quickly, huh? you know, the three tiers uh, uh, architecture where you have the presentation layers in front of the, the users, and then you have uh, the back end with all the data, and it's called monolithic because this middle layer is executed on one single node, all right? That's why it's a monolith. Uh, you have a variant of that, which is called modular monolith, when you do some uh, software architecture within this, uh, this layer. So you have module, for instance, here, business layer, persistence layer, but it can be any, anything. Uh, but it's still executed, for instance, if it's in Java, on the same JVM. Then, 
when you try to distribute, for instance, those modules that were in the modular monolith, you distribute them and you execute, it, you execute them on the different uh, nodes, then it becomes services. And then you have service-oriented architecture, or you still have this uh, presentation layer that is dispatching the calls to, the, to the, the different services, and you still have the database or something that is uh, dealing and managing coherence of the data between all the services. And now, if you want to go beyond, if you want to orchestrate, if you, uh, all of these services through, for instance, a workflow, you can use the orchestration pattern. It will help you with an orchestration engine to, uh, to make workflows uh, to orchestrate all the transactions. The main point of this architecture is not really on the technical side, even if you consider that the enterprise service bus orchestration engine could be a single port of failures. It's most on the organization side. Because usually you have dedicated team uh, working in, in organizational silos, which create in different paces their services and they deliver them, they upgrade them on different paces. And you have in the middle a team responsible for making the glue of that. Right. And this team will wait for new releases of, uh, for instance, the billing services or in the delivery services. It's completely cumbersome and uh, you will have uh, some delays in your delivery process um, at the end of the day. One of our pattern is mostly the event-driven um, architecture. Now you have to think your, your architecture asynchronously. Why? Because you, you have components which broadcast events through an event processing platform. On the other part, you have other components which subscribe to these events and potentially create new ones. You usually talk about eventual consistency in this uh, kind of architecture. Why? Because all the transactions are run asynchronously. Last but not least, the microservices. Yes, yes, hold on on that. Because microservices, is it a kind of architecture or is it just a buzz? Because for me, maybe it's kind of a macro services that are on a diet or something, no? Is it something new there? Yeah, we can say that after waiting the last article from the Prime Video <laughs> Tech well, blog that uh, yeah, everybody yeah, wants yeah, to yeah. go back to uh, the monolith. Uh, it's both a technical pattern and organizational pattern. Ah, right. Why? Because the technical, because your every service got its own API, it's reachable only, only through an API, and got its own database. And organizational, why? Because Behind every service, you've got a dedicated team. Usually, we talk about you own it, you own it. And that's your uh, right. The point you right is uh, you need to avoid l uh, tight coupling be uh, between every service, as if it's possible. Um, that's the point. Okay. About microservices. Now that's clear. And yeah, I see the database stuff and the and, organizational. And stuff. for that, yeah. I forgot just uh, you can use a DDD principle and identify the button context. All right, all right. Okay. Uh, now? Yes, if we go back now to the criteria you presented uh, earlier, uh, we could use a table like that. The idea. again, it's based on our own uh, feedback uh, from Alex and me. What is important is not how many triangles we put in, a, in any cells. The idea is to show, to have a, something, a frame of reference to base your decision on, and it can base on uh, any input or, or feedback or best practices you have. So if we go back to the Donut at Home uh, yeah. project, uh, because uh, they wanted something that uh, will scale, they don't really know uh, how many users they will have and uh, what will be the success of their new offer. Uh, I think that uh, we can remove the monolith and uh, the orchestration. Yeah. Uh, basically, it's it's yeah. I mean, it's it's done at at home, but uh, they might decide to to start. I don't know waffle at home start in Belgium, you know, in, in case uh, it works. And then, you know, di diversity and uh, create new, new offering. I think it's, it's better to remove those architecture from now. Uh, yes, and we, if we remove uh, orchestration, we can remove SOA too, I think. Yeah, well, yeah, basically it's... Okay, okay. so cool. now what about event-driven and microservices? What's your, what's your opinion? 
Well, I'm, because I don't know how many users will be on the platform, I have to admit that the performances are kind of uh, scaring me. Uh, I like the event-driven architecture for that, you know, because you have uh, asynchronous uh, communication and stuff. It's, uh, I feel more at ease, but... Uh, yeah, I think, think, yeah, it makes sense, but uh, I think because we would like to add new features easily, we don't have information yet about some points, uh, it could be nice to focus on testability if you're okay. So to choose uh, to start with the microservices pattern. Oh, yeah, 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 I agree. Yes, because it's important when we design things uh, to take into account other people that will be involved in the project. And testability is a good way to not forget other people, you know. And yes, maybe let's start with microservices. Okay. Uh, easier to test and then we'll see how it goes. So I identified the three main domains, the shopping, the bidding, and the customer with uh, three services. Uh, the bidding service got two databases, one for the, the bills with an object storage and one database. And uh, we got uh, three APIs on top of that. And uh, choose also to implement a back for front pattern in the presentation layer. Yeah, OK. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's what do you nice. think? Yeah, yeah, like this. Yeah, microservice stuff is nice because, yes, you have different databases and stuff. But there's something that is still annoying me here. Yeah. Because uh, you see, uh, we are very dependent on the external uh, delivery platform. So we're linked in the HTTP uh, synchronous communication. So if the platform is down, then uh, we have problem in our, in our system. And I think that uh, those two uh, internal services, billing and shopping, are kind of uh, too tightly coupled. Uh, so if the performance and the, the scalability uh, uh, needs increase, uh, we might have some problem. I'd like to put some, you know, a way to, to, to some, uh, so maybe in synchronous uh, communication between uh, shopping services and the- You want to make uh, microservices event, event processing in an event processing yeah, platform? Yeah, something like that, yes. Okay, maybe. we can do that, I guess. Yes, yes, that would be nice because then, the shopping and the billing services now are, are, are decoupled a, a little bit regarding performance, for instance. And I like the fact that we, we still uh, discuss with the external system with uh, HTTP and their own uh, protocols, but then we change the paradigm, paradigm when we enter our system and then we go on a message-based uh, communication. Now I feel more comfortable with that. Okay, okay, so now we agree with the kind of architecture. It start. To, it could be nice now to choose the regarding the regard, the technologies. Sorry. Yeah. So I propose to use Spring Boot for the APIs because we used to uh, we used to use this technology. Yeah, Spring Boot. Yeah, we use that also uh, on the, on the Omega project. Um, but uh, maybe it's the opportunity to, to check and to think about, because I, I, I've checked uh, another conference. Uh, they were comparing Spring Boot and Kafka uh, yeah. just, just before. Uh, let's check uh, maybe regarding technology, what is the tech radar of the company, what they propose. Because when you check that, in this domain, they also recommend uh, Quarkus as a production ready. Uh, so maybe it's the opportunity to adopt Quarkus because we use microservice in one or on one or of, of the services. Uh, because I don't know if you noticed, but uh, in the company they did a lot of training, a lot of communication regarding Quarkus, and it will be easier to find and source developers and motivated developers. You know. So what do you think? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. I propose to use Quarkus on the back office. Yeah, uh, just to mitigate the risk, if you're okay. So yeah. uh, we have uh, two main uh, or two main front office, uh, if I could say that, microservices uh, which use uh, Spring Boot, and we have for the back office Quarkus. Um, we also talked with the uh, database administrator and said, okay, um, use Postgres or MongoDB, it will fit your needs. Um, and you can decide, uh, is it Mongo or Postgres later? Well, yes, and we have um, decision trees to, to make our decisions. All right. And for the uh, presentation uh, layer, I propose to use React for the front end and Node.js for back for front. Oh, yeah, that's very classical. But uh, 
I don't know if you heard about uh, Hype.js. I was in a, in a demo from the labs uh, last week. They spoke about this new framework, Hype.js. It's a JavaScript uh, full stack framework. Wow, I was impressed. It's very amazing and, uh, and promising. Uh. Maybe it's the opportunity to test it on the project. Now, what do you think? OK, a full stack JavaScript framework. Yeah. OK. No, okay. you don't. Yeah, so yeah, it was demonstrated by the HRD. Uh, yes, the labs. Did you have any real life uh, project feedback? Oh no, you know the labs. It's just demos and stuff for now. No. Don't have a, yeah, that's. Is, okay, is it available in your te on your tech radar? Oh, it's on the tech radar, but it's yeah, you're right. It's not production ready, I guess. I think it's not the time. <laughs> we are not ready yet. Okay, to okay, okay. Because okay, okay. technology. Right. Okay, so let's stick to React and uh, Node.js then. Yes, and regarding the event processing uh, platform, there it's uh, very clear uh, we, we stay on Kafka because the ops team, they are very happy with that and they spend uh, quite a lot of time to uh, uh, train and, uh, um, and make sure that uh, they are able to exploit the, the solution, to, to run it. And also uh, they did a lot of work around observability of, uh, of this component because it's key when you distribute uh, things. So let's stick to Kafka. And yes, I wanted to make a little bit focus because uh, we speak about observability. Uh, observability uh, is something that uh, we should do by design. It's not something that you put on your architecture after you design it. It's a capacity of the platform to make itself observable from outside. Uh, and I, I've taken this, uh, this uh, schema for, from a, a project of mine uh, just to, to show and illustrate that it's an architecture. It's not a bunch of tools that you just uh, throw on the architecture. It's something that you have to make sure it's designed and then uh, what uh, services and what capacity of the platform you provide. But let's, let's finish on this, yeah. uh, on this part. So now I think it's time to update your risk analysis matrix. Uh, we mitigated the risk of the observability, the unavailability of external system, and the response time. We put this risk and we assess them in this matrix uh, in green for the response time because we added an event processing pattern and uh, the same with the unavailability of external systems and the observability. To sum up this chapter, uh, don't forget to update your risk analysis and do it at different levels. It's very important. Accept new point of views. It's by the discussion, by assessment, by confronting your point of views, you will be, you will be better. Yes, and by, by accepting other point of view, or op opening, opening your mind, uh, it's open also for innovation. But the question is uh, when to innovate. As you saw, Hype.js is not always the, the best choice. So you have to decide what are the risks uh, you, are, you are taking. And to, to mitigate those risks, you can rely on uh, feedbacks, on tech radars, on uh, well, discussion with your peers also. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we don't have too much time to, di to deep dive on that aspect, but it's very important when you design an architecture to think about the organization that is uh, behind. Uh, the architecture or, or for, for who the architecture is, uh, is made. So you know about the Conway law and that kind of stuff. Uh, we saw that when uh, uh, we decided not to forget other, other teams and other people involved uh, in the architecture, uh, like uh, people in charge of tests or uh, the ops uh, regarding observability, for instance. So we assessed the functional view, the application view. Now it's time to make it real. And we have to, um, to deal with the infrastructure. So the question we decided at the beginning of the presentation to host our application on the top of, on the cloud. Yeah. So private or public cloud? Yeah, the ID private or, or public cloud. Yeah, that's uh, well. It depends. It depends on the context of the the customers. Uh, whether they already have something internal, something do, do they use the cloud service providers? So it could be on main uh, service providers or other, other local providers, maybe, or it could be internalized. Uh, but for me, the important point regarding cloud is, uh, uh, and the first question we should ask ourselves is how we will use the cloud, whatever it's internal or external, because you have many options when you, when you use cloud. And basically, when you, you translate 
uh, you transpose uh, all the views that we did before on an infrastructure, you have many ways to deploy on the cloud. Uh, you can, for instance, deploy virtual machine on a YAS infrastructure uh, as a service uh, platform. So, for instance, in our architecture, that could be uh, a database or heavy database or EV uh, processing uh, message uh, processing platform like Kafka, for instance. Uh, but we can also deploy containers uh, like uh, the, the services uh, made with uh, Spring Boot and, uh, and MongoDB, uh, uh, with Quarkus, sorry, and uh, MongoDB could also be in containers uh, depending on the use case, on the size of the database. And when we speak about uh, CAS and uh, deploying on containers, we can even have uh, on top of those uh, layers some uh, mesh platforms for you, uh, like Istio and uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, But uh, you can also uh, use some uh, managed uh, services uh, provided by a platform as a service uh, because it's not your core business. So, for instance, when you deal with uh, users, uh, authentication, API management, or observability, try not to, to spend too much energy there and use uh, services offered by, uh, by the cloud provider. And it can also be uh, software as a service uh, when you consume external services like we decided to do with uh, payment, for instance. So we have many options, and I think that uh, we won't have time in this first meeting re regarding the, the architecture. We'll have many more because uh, designing an architecture is a long process. Uh, we could discuss that later, uh, how and which component we'll uh, deploy on uh, a yeah, well, kind of uh, cloud. Well, we can yeah. also base your reflection uh, on the, uh, the requirements you stated at the first, uh, during the first step. Uh, it's really important. Yeah, and one important point um, is um, compliance uh, with requirements. Because we, we said, okay, we have to design the architecture and different views for the different stakeholders to make sure that everybody is on board and everybody agrees with uh, the design. But uh, so it's important and it's made for that to, to be able to exchange and communicate with the different uh, uh, people and teams, whether they be business, uh, devs, ops, finance experts, any other team. So you find the, the appropriate view to discuss with them. It can be, uh, depending on the size of the project and the kind of organization you're working for, uh, it could be necessary to formalize the co commitment to make sure that uh, everybody agrees and then we can move forward and not spend too much time about rediscussing the, the same things. Even if that will occur, that's why we have to formalize things. Uh, and maybe also uh, even have some uh, validation steps like gates or, or with uh, uh, instances like uh, architecture review boards or design authority or wh whatever you name it, but where you're, you formalize really the commitment of the different uh, teams and the different stakeholders on the architecture. It's very important. Um, and regarding infrastructure, um, it's also the, important to verify the hypothesis that uh, we make uh, during the design phase. Uh, for instance, it can be with uh, POC. Uh, it's important also to size things, uh, speci especially regarding non-functional uh, requirements, you know, to reach the SLO, the number, maximum response time and stuff. Uh, because uh, I, I often heard hear that uh, people say, okay, uh, it's on the cloud, so we don't need to, to really do this uh, annoying job of sizing how many CPUs or memory or stuff I need, uh, because, you know, it's, it scales, so we don't have to, to, to worry about that. They say, that for sure, something is scaling, it's the price. That's for sure. But uh, if you don't know what you're doing, then uh, you're, you're going to have some, uh, some, some bad, bad discoveries. So it's important to do that. And last point is about, don't forget that it's an iterative work. During this presentation, we go through the business view, uh, functional view, application view, infrastructure. But don't hesitate to iterate again and again to focus and to get the most appropriate architecture. For instance, uh, during a project, a customer asked, uh, asked me to design an application with 3.9 availability. You say, OK, why not? We know that. But so we define the whole, uh, the functional view, we design the application view and the infrastructure. 
and then we gave him the cost. And we challenged the, the cost and the performance regarding this requirement. And that's why we did another iteration to assess again uh, its requirements. And yeah. by the way, we, do, uh, we choose to reduce the availability uh, of the platform. Yeah, but I think yeah, it's, it's very iterative because the way we show you today the, the process, it, it looks like a linear and sequenced, sequenced uh, process, like going from the, the business view to an infrastructure, but it's a cycle. You have to go through with many meetings, uh, rediscussing with the, the stakeholders because things will change, we have to adapt. What is very important uh, is to make sure that everybody is on board and uh, do, do not hesitate to, to make another cycle and to recheck things uh, because then you, you, will, uh, you, you, you won't lose too much time uh, afterwards. Yeah, and potentially it will help you having um, most, uh, sim the most simple architecture you could use for this project. Yeah, simplify on the process. Yeah. Yeah. So now, Okay. To wrap our presentation. For your next architecture studies, don't forget, first, first of all, uh, step back, take a breath, don't panic, remain open minded, and share your vision with all the stakeholders. It's really important. Yeah, and the approach uh, it's important to formalize and trace things. So we saw it with ADR, with the formalism, with the matrix, with uh, many things like Reunion, ARB, Design Authority, anything. It's very important to do that because that's how we, you are able to exchange and communicate and collaborate with all the stakeholders. And as I just said, it's very important to onboard everybody. The architecture is not the, 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 the concern of the architect. The architect for me is uh, in charge of uh, making sure that the different views are aligned. So the architect is able to discuss with everybody and make sure that everybody agrees on the design. And before uh, architecturing and designing your, first, your next application, uh, don't hesitate to create your own toolbox with blueprints, patterns, articles, documentations. Create your technical roadmap and update it on a regular basis with, and share it with all the stakeholders, production managers and developers. And most of all, try to be pragmatic. Uh, for, your decision, uh, for your next decision and try to avoid uh, hype-driven development or resume-driven <laughs> development, for instance. Yeah. And everything's going to be okay. <laughs> so right. thank you very much. Um, if, uh, if you have any questions, we have uh, eight minutes left to answer them. And thank you for your participation to the design of the architecture. Your help was very, very insightful. <laughs> You're yeah. the, the, the third architect, uh, of course. And don't hesitate to give us a feedback. It's very important for us. Thank you very much.